Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this has been such a stimulating day, and I'm pleased to note that we have more terrifically engaging work still ahead. Our final session of the day begins now. As legislators forward revised boundaries for schools and the persons within them, LGBTQ identities sit at the center of much of this attention. This panel attends to nuanced understandings of these policies and our possible collective responses. We'll be led today by Dr. Molly Blackburn. Dr. Blackburn is a professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning here in the College of Education and Human Ecology at Ohio State University. Her research focuses on literacy, language, and social change, with particular attention to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning youth and the teachers who serve them. We're extremely lucky to have her here as the ideal guide for our work ahead in this session. Please do join me in welcoming Dr. Molly Blackburn. Thank you for those of you who have stuck around. It's nice to see you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Thompson, for the nice introduction and for the conference. All of you have put together the conference. I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot today, and it's just nice to be, what we were saying earlier, just to be like a part of smart people talking about things they care a lot about, and it's just, I feel grateful. So to, and to continue that, um, I would like to first introduce Zane Murib, who is an assistant professor of political science at Fordham. Their forthcoming book with Oxford University Press is entitled Terms of Exclusion, Rightful Citizenship Claims, and LGBT po Political Identity, which examines the social movement, activism, and interest group advocacy on behalf of LGBT people from 1968 to 2004. It's the year before I was born, 1968. <laughs> um, Europe argues that rightful citizenship claims are the contention by political actors that lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, and transgender people are denied rights owed to them as citizens, created by the conditions of recognizing white, gender normative, and monog monogamously partnered gay men and lesbians in institutions of citizenship, such as marriage or the military. Over time, and as a result, representations of interests that are most pressing for LGBT-identified people who are black, Latinx, Asian, native, transgender, non-Christian, undocumented, incarcerated, and or subjected to intensified forms of surveillance were foreclosed. Murab's work has been published in Transgender Studies Quarterly, Politics, Groups, and Identities, and New Political Science. Please join me in welcoming Zane. Um, thank you for that introduction and for the invitation to uh, speak today. I'm excited to share with you um, some of my thinking on these topics. Inshallah, the technology works. Nope. Yeah, all right. Um, great. So um, I want to open this presentation with the observation that what appears to be a problem of identities uh, is actually one that tracks more closely along the political development of the United States, uh, during which assertions of rights and privileges for some have come at the expense of what scholars refer to as constitutive exclusions, or exclusion that, exclusions that define the borders of who is included in the polity as citizens and who is not. Those affected by these historic exclusions and their present day legacies will be familiar to most uh, black people, Asians, Latinx people, women, natives, non and non-citizens to name just a few. In more contemporary political discourse, uh, and I love the way that this talk is coming after this morning's sessions because I think that it, it segues really nicely, um, these exclusions take the form of coordinating efforts to enshrine discriminatory laws and policies that target black protesters, critical race scholars, and lesbians, gay men, and transgender people. Um, so here in Ohio, for example, and I was just speaking with Molly about this before the session, um, the school board is posed to hear testimony in a couple of weeks on the following resolution, which uses the language of parental rights to justify a raft of policies that would make the existence of transgender and gender non-conforming people impossible in public space. 
it would do this through the, ex, uh, the denial of access to restroom facilities or participation or and or participation on sports teams. And policies such as these claim to be rooted in logic, pointing to biology as self-evident facts that justify the mutability of sex. But I and other scholars interpret this as veil thinly veiled bigotry. So take, for example, the school board member who introduced this resolution uh, during testimony on October 4th said the following. Um, Kids are identifying as cats and using litter boxes in the classrooms. Um, and then the, the writer goes on to say, a long busted myth that originated on fascist online forums. He acknowledged that his resolution would increase suicide rates, but admitted that it wasn't his main concern. So discourse such as Shay's here is used as a wedge to divide groups into those who are human and deserve to live and those who are inhuman and consigned to death. Um, in case you think I am picking on Ohio, uh, resolutions of policies such as these are not alone. Uh, this is a map of states in 2022, 35 of which have at least one proposed anti-trans bill uh, in a state legislature. And this builds, if you were surprised to not see Texas and Florida on the 2022 map, it's because they did this first in 2021, um, a year that saw hundreds of these types of bills introduced across the states. Uh, so in this presentation, I'll offer an answer to the following question. Um, why has there been an explosion in anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ, and anti-CRT legislation and policies since 2020? Um, I'm going to argue that broadly, these efforts are gaining steam in this current moment um, because there's a perception on the right that the courts will rule in their favor, that it's kind of open season and they can push these discriminatory uh, policies and laws in, and to some extent that's played out. Um, this is also part of a pragmatic electoral strategy that aims to get voters to the polls uh, during a midterm election uh, that historically have low turnout by um, having putting moral issues on the ballot. So uh, historically, this has been uh, same-sex marriage, teaching about systemic raci racism, and now trans rights. And finally, uh, and I think this is the most important point that I want to make today, is that we see these bills popping up because they represent the continuation of a 50-year effort by evangelical and conservative political actors to assert the white supremacist heteronormative nuclear family comprised of one man and one woman as the building blocks of the nation. So in my research, I'm interested in examining the extent to which this elite-driven discourse uh, reflects is reflected in broader political and social discourse and so I asked this question in a recent article published in a journal called Laws uh, which looked at how social media users understand the issue of transgender athletes in high school athletics and my research design was as follows um, I sampled three YouTube videos um, on transgender athletes Andrea Yearwood and Terry Miller pictured here um, one was from ABC News, which I classify as a neutral news source. Uh, the next one was the AFL-CIO, which was a pro-trans representation. And the final one was the Alliance Defending Freedom, which I classify as a conservative uh, or uh, opposition to trans athletes. I scraped over 60,000 comments made on these videos uh, by YouTube users. And I did two different forms of analysis. Uh, the first was qualitative. We hand-coded, me and a research assistant, uh, hand-coded 10% of the top liked comments. And then to make sure that the top liked comments weren't, uh, were representative and not liked because they were inflammatory and extreme, we also coded 10% of the remaining comments. And we found that there was an alignment across those. And I can talk more about that in the Q&A if there's questions about that. And then I conducted a large and automated text analysis that uses computer learning to explore latent connections amongst terms in the, the context, uh, the, the text itself. Um, and the findings can be summarized as falling into three main themes. I'll take each of these in turn in the following slides, but I'll summarize them here. Um, an attachment to biology as determinative of athletic abilities. Uh, the second one is racialized understandings of who constitutes a proper girl. And then finally, uh, a commitment to sex segregated sports as the only way to ensure fairness for non-trans girls in sports. So I'll show you a little bit of what this looked like in the qualitative analysis. So um, for example, the attachment to biology. Uh, this is a comment from a YouTube user that was very well liked uh, that, that makes uh, 10 statements that are posed as facts um, rooted in science. And so, um, 
basically, the, uh, there's this resort here, and I could go through each of these comments, but uh, Katrina Karkasis and Rebecca Jordan Young are two sociologists who refer to this, re this recruitment of testosterone as determinative of athletic ability as T-talk that has implications for how it is that we understand gender relations in the broader uh, social and political order. So for example, uh, this idea here that um, men have greater amount of muscle bulk than women, uh, parentheses, more power, uh, and again, again more power, advantage in many ways, helps with sprinting, uh, is this reiteration of this presumed natural dominance of men uh, or people assigned male at birth in sports that translates to a subordinated position for people assigned female or people identify as women in social roles, right? Um, it should be noted that these qualities uh, such as more power uh, and uh, we'll just say more power in this brief moment, um, are only celebrated when they show up in white boys. Um, and so, for example, another way that commentators refer to biology um, in an attempt to seal their comments off from critique is by drawing analogies to other forms of presumably biologically informed differences, uh, namely skin tone and by association race. Um, in other instances, biology is posed as static and irrefutable through comparisons to biological variations between species. This logic follows a familiar and simplistic pattern. Since black people cannot change the color of their skin tone, which is posed as rooted in biological factors such as the presence of melanin, men and women are also unable to change their genetic ident or their gender identities due to the constraints of biology, uh, such as chromosomes or the presence or absence of certain genitals or uh, secondary sex characteristics. Statements such as these are often posed as absurd to underscore the self-evident nature of the criticism directed against transgender athletes. For example, one author speculates, and I highlight this person here, if Mike Tyson says he identifies as a woman and steps in the ring as a woman against a biological woman, what would be said? Um, it was actually eerie the, the number of times that Mike Tyson appeared, and I, I think that this is because um, he has a history of abuse towards women. And so there's this way of mapping that, ex that um, archetype onto these athletes, right, to justify their exclusion from competing um, against non-trans women. Um, and then, you know, these, uh, these analogies here, why don't the real girls identify themselves as motorbikes and race with transgender on, with motorbikes. I, I mean, they're nonsensical, but they all accomplish, I would argue, the same ends, which is to make the public sphere impossible for trans people to exist. It's posing it as ridiculous in order to make that implication. Um, finally, many of the comments proposed establishing an alternate league for transgender athletes. Um, this reflects 2017 research by political scientists that found that in general, the public is supportive of civil rights for transgender people, but that support drops when respondents are asked about trans people sharing public space with them. So here the idea seems to be that further segregation to build, the div build on the division between men's and women's sports um, to have transgender sports might be the best way to ensure fairness. Here fairness is defined as winning. Uh, there's a lot of, I read, I don't actually, I, I'm uh, at Ohio State and I'm going to say this and maybe the football gods will strike me dead, but uh, I'm not a sports person. I read a lot about sports as I was uh, doing this research and it was really interesting because the research generally um, agrees that at the K through 12 level, the benefits of sports for kids is not winning, right? It's camaraderie, it's developing skills, it's developing, uh, you know, the commitment to perfecting uh, different sorts of um, uh, abilities. Um, and so, but here fairness is posed in, in relation to winning. And so another way that the, the terrain is being shifted to exclude trans people. Um, these, the following three slides prevent, or present the findings from the automated text analysis. Uh, and again, I won't go through these in too much detail, but this is from the ABC News video. So basically what happens is all the comments get made into like what is called a big bag of words, and then the computer explores latent connections amongst the terms. And so for example, in topic three, uh, the words that group together most frequently are male, female biology um, with born, which also implies immutability, right? So here we're seeing biology being collapsed with immutability to say that 
transness does not exist. Um, but topic five reflects my second finding from the, the second theme from the previous slide, um, that there are racialized understandings of who constitutes a proper girl. Um, and in this case, uh, there's a lot of pejoratives, right? It's LOL, fucking shit, dudes, fuck, to, look, black, stupid. Um, and this shows up in the ATA for all three of the videos. So again, conflating um, these girls' identities with pejorative terms that are uh, explicitly racist. Uh, and so I'll just go through these real quickly. Um, but I, I wanna conclude with three suggestions for how to approach this political moment. And we have a lot to build on today. Um, and so hopefully this will, um, this won't be surprising at all. Um, the first is to, th I think that it's critical to change the conversation. Um, this would look something like destigmatizing exogenous hormones and surgeries to underscore the ways that many people access these interventions throughout their lifetimes. Um, so for example, women who are premenopausal or menopausal often use estrogen in order to maintain soft skin and hair. That is about gender. Uh, similarly, my brother uh, is a bodybuilder. Uh, I texted him and I was like, I'm where the Arnold is held. Um, and he has told me that they will use uh, that bodybuilder builders, off, not all of them, but some will use testosterone in order to build muscle mass and then before weigh-ins use estrogen to drop it so that they can compete at a higher level, right? So there's lots of different ways that hormones are being used and yet it's being um, leveraged in this specific context uh, to stigmatize trans people and I would argue to epistemically erase them from public space. Um, the second suggestion is obvious, structural shifts to eliminate unnecessary sex segregation in public spaces and school athletics. Um, so this looks like single occupancy restrooms. Um, anyone who's traveled in Europe or cities where these uh, architectural innovations are taking place, it's basically floor to ceiling dividers and doors, a room the, with those around the border of it and then a sink in the middle, right? It doesn't matter, it's not sex segregated, it doesn't need to be sex segregated. Um, and in fact, those are shown to be more safe than the current configuration of public restrooms. Um, and school athletics. So um, I'm happy to talk more um, in the discussion about which sports have been proposed to be desegregated by sex. Um, but here, it, the, the key point would be thinking about where sex segregation serves a rational purpose. Uh, and then finally, I think it's important to look at this moment through an intersectional lens that is attentive to the ways that things like don't say gay legislation is linked in intent to legislation that decriminalizes driving into crowds of protesters, right? So looking at these things as not separate issues where we say, okay, there's this anti-trans legislation and there's this anti-CRT legislation here, but seeing that actually over time they're becoming more and more separate, but the, the initial moments of these legislations is that there's, I mean, we were talking about this before, there's like these weird gender things that pop up in anti-CRT legislation. And so using an intersectional lens to draw attention to that, I think will help us to develop uh, responses that can be more holistic in the long run. So I'll end there, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Zane. I really, um Learned a lot from your talk, I appreciate it. Um, the next speaker I want to introduce, I want to tell you, will join us. Um, there's a, a video of his talk. It's, um, it's Clifford Rosky, um, and he is recovering, he, he's recovering from surgery. He'll mention this in his video, but he said he forgot to mention that the surgery was successful, and now he's cancer-free, and he wanted to make sure that you knew that um, b before you were listening to him. So I will introduce him, but just know that about him when you're watching his video. So Clifford Rosky is a professor of law at the University of Utah's S.J. Quinney College of Law, where he teaches courses on constitutional law, criminal law, mindfulness in law, and sexuality, gender, and law. His recent scholarship includes anti-gay curriculum laws in the Columbia Law Review and Don't Say Gay in the Illinois Law Review. Roski has received multiple awards for his teaching and pro bono service, and he is a two-time recipient of the Duke Minor Award, which recognizes the best legal scholarship on sexuality and gender published each year. He has provided legal commentary on LGBTQ rights to many press outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, Associated Press, Agents 
um, France Press, The Economist, and, and National Public Radio, Newsweek, and Time. In recent years, Roski has helped develop and advocate for five Utah laws that protect LGBT people from discrimination and bullying, conversion therapy, hate crimes, education, employment, and housing. In addition, he has served as an expert witness and counsel of record in the country's first lawsuits successfully challenging the constitutionality of statewide anti-LGBT curriculum laws in Arizona, South Carolina, and Utah. And I'm thinking back to, um, to Zane's maps here and trying to imagine how it could be different. Um, but please, uh, well, we will welcome the video of uh, Dr. Rasky. Thank you. First, I want to thank Dr. Winston Thompson and everyone else who organized this conference for inviting me. I'm sorry I can't be there with you. I'm recovering from surgery for cancer and I'm not quite ready to fly yet. To avoid any connectivity problems, Dr. Thompson wisely invited me to pre-record my talk and then join you by audio for the panel. So now I have the uh, distinct pleasure of listening to myself talk. The title of my talk is Don't Say Gay Laws Then and Now. Five years ago, I wrote an article called Anti-Gay Curriculum Laws, which was about laws that prohibit or restrict the discussion of LGBT people and issues in public schools. In 2017, when I published my article, 20 states still had such laws. But in the last five years, several states have recognized that these laws are unconstitutional because they violate the Equal Protection Clause. In 2016, while I was still writing my article, I served as an expert witness on the legal team that filed Equality Utah versus Utah State Board of Education. This was the country's first successful challenge to an anti-gay curriculum law. In our lawsuit, we challenged the constitutionality of Utah's so-called no promo homo law, which forbade, quote, the advocacy of homosexuality by public school teachers. Much to our surprise and delight, the Utah legislature repealed the law by nearly unanimous margins only six months after we filed the lawsuit. Apparently, the attorney general had advised the legislature that if they didn't repeal the law, the state would end up losing the lawsuit and paying our bills. In the years since, I have continued working with the National Center for Lesbian Rights and Lambda Legal to file similar claims in states like Arizona and South Carolina. In Arizona, the superintendent immediately agreed with our claims upon the filing of our complaint, and the legislature repealed the state's anti-gay curriculum law two weeks later. In South Carolina, the attorney general issued a formal opinion agreeing with us a day before we filed our complaint, and within two weeks, the court had entered a consent decree and a judgment in which the defendants, the plaintiffs, and the court all agreed that the state's don't say gay law was unconstitutional. So again and again, we see even conservative states repealing these laws, or at least recognizing that they violate the Equal Protection Clause and cannot be enforced. But in March 2022, this bipartisan trend came to a screeching halt. Rather than repealing an anti-gay curriculum law, the state of Florida actually adopted a new one, the first such law adopted in the United States in 20 years. Officially named the Parental Rights in Education Law and popularly known as the Don't Say Gay Law, HB 1557 provides that, quote, classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through grade three or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. In his signing statement, Governor Ron DeSantis declared that the law would prevent schools from, quote, using classroom instruction to sexualize their kids as young as five years old. During the legislative debates, his press secretary dubbed the law the anti-grooming law and implied that anyone who opposed it was probably a groomer. For those of you who remember or study gay history in the late 1970s, this campaign was all too familiar. 45 years ago, Anita Bryant launched a national campaign to save our children from the threat of what she called homosexual recruitment, invoking the very same themes of seduction, indoctrination, and role modeling that Governor DeSantis invoked in defense of HB 1557. 
But of course, much has changed in politics since the late 1970s, especially when it comes to gay rights. Thanks to a series of landmark victories in the US Supreme Court, being gay is no longer illegal. In four cases decided over a period of 25 years, Romer v. Evans, Lawrence v. Texas, United States v. Windsor, and Obergefell v. Hodges, the court has now recognized that anti-gay laws can violate the Equal Protection Clause, that same-sex intimacy can no longer be made criminal, and that same-sex couples must have the freedom to marry in all 50 states. In response to these seismic developments, the state of Florida drafted a law that purports to be different from previous anti-gay curriculum laws. So for the rest of this talk, what I'd like to do is just briefly explain the four ways that the lawyers who wrote this law tried to make it different from prior anti-gay curriculum laws, and then explain the constitutional irrelevance of each of those differences. First, parental enforcement. HB 1557 allows for parents to enforce it. If any parent thinks that a teacher has violated the law, they may bring a lawsuit against the school district seeking an injunction, damages, and attorney's fees. This feature is novel, but it doesn't make the law consistent with the Equal Protection Clause. Frankly, it's not clear that it even matters in the constitutional analysis. Whether a law violates the Equal Protection Clause usually turns on whether the law is discriminatory and whether that discrimination can be justified. But if parental enforcement means anything in this context, it would only increase the vagueness and arbitrariness of the law by multiplying the opportunities for discriminatory enforcement. Simply put, allowing parents to enforce the law rather than say the attorney general or the board of education vastly multiplies the number of parties who can interpret and enforce it. Almost by definition, the parents who interpret the law in the most restrictive manner are going to be the parents who are most likely to bring the lawsuits enforcing it. Although these lawsuits will ultimately be decided by courts, not parents, they do seem likely to have a significant chilling effect on school districts and teachers. If HB 1557 discriminates against LGBT people without any good reason, the fact that it allows parents to enforce it cannot provide one. Second grade level. HB 1557 includes two separate policies based on grade level. Between kindergarten and third grade, discussions of sexual orientation and gender identity are completely prohibited. Between fourth and 12th grades, these discussions are at least nominally permitted so long as they are age appropriate, developmentally appropriate, and consistent with state standards. Now, one can certainly object that these latter requirements are arbitrary and vague, especially given that they'll be defined lawsuit by lawsuit rather than state educational authorities. But in any event, the fact that the law has two separate policies based on grade level doesn't save it from a challenge under the Equal Protection Clause. If the law discriminates against LGBT people without a good reason, the fact that it has two separate policies for two groups of students certainly does not provide one. Third, gender identity. Unlike previous anti-gay curriculum laws, this law explicitly prohibits discussions of gender identity, that is transgender people and issues. By contrast, previous laws restricted discussions of quote, homosexuality or homosexual activity or the homosexual lifestyle without mentioning gender identity or transgender people at all. In this sense, we might say that Florida's new law is the country's first explicitly anti-LGBT curriculum law. But again, the inclusion of gender identity cannot render the law constitutional. On the contrary, it signals the legislature's intent to discriminate against transgender students and families in addition to lesbian, gay, and bisexual students and families. Indeed, when the governor signed the law, he specifically expressed concerns about children learning about transgender people. If this law otherwise violates the Equal Protection Clause, which it does, the inclusion of gender identity only exacerbates this constitutional error. And now we come to the fourth difference, which is by far the most significant and interesting, although I don't think it changes the result. It's called facial neutrality. Unlike previous anti-gay curriculum laws, the text of HB 1557 
is written in a facially neutral manner. It prohibits and restricts the discussion of sexual orientation rather than just homosexuality and gender identity rather than what I think Governor DeSantis might call transgenderism, being transgender. Even as a textual matter, though, it seems implausible to think that the law would actually be applied in a neutral manner. By way of example, let's imagine how the law might be applied to two award-winning books often taught to children between kindergarten and third grade. The first book is Make Way for Ducklings, and the second is And Tango Makes Three. Both of these stories feature a pair of birds raising babies together. In the first book, a pair of ducks named Mr. and Mrs. Mallard, searched through Boston for a suitable place to raise a flock of ducklings, eventually settling on an island in the Charles River. In the second book, a pair of penguins named Roy and Silo sing, swim, and build a nest together in Central Park at the zoo, and eventually incubate an egg and raise a chick together. The key difference, of course, is that Mr. and Mrs. Mallard are um, male and female, Roy and Silo, both male. If HB 1557 were applied in a neutral manner, both books would have to be banned. They both present stories that focus on the sexual orientation and gender identity of the baby bird's parents. But especially given the law's parental enforcement provisions, it's hard to imagine that this would actually happen. Since it was published, and Tango Makes Three has been one of the most banned books in the United States and in the world. Unsurprisingly, I have been unable to find a single report of a school banning make way for ducklings. Now, under the Supreme Court's previous cases, several factors are considered in determining whether a facially neutral policy is based on a discriminatory intent and therefore unconstitutional. They are the historical background of the law, the specific sequence of events that led up to it, and any of the states, um, any they, we call them departures from the normal procedures um, that led to the adoption of this law. In other words, whether the law was adopted through abnormal procedures. If we look to each of these factors, we can find evidence of HB 1557 discriminatory intent. First, historical background. Florida has a long track record of discriminating against same-sex relationships, including within the context of public school curricula. In 2003, Florida adopted a law requiring teachers to teach the benefits of monogamous heterosexual marriage. That word is in the law. They have to teach the benefits of monogamous heterosexual marriage while providing AIDS education in public schools. In 2008, Florida voters adopted Amendment 2, which defined marriage as a union only between one man and one woman, and thus banned the creation of similar unions, such as civil unions or same-sex marriages. In 2022, during the Senate debate over this law, the Don't Say Gay Law, HB 1557, Senator Farmer introduced an amendment to remove the word heterosexual from the AIDS education law in light of the Supreme Court's ruling in Obergefell v. Hodges. The amendment was rejected by the Florida legislature. Specific sequence. What led to the passage of HB 1557? Well, one year earlier in 2021, a parent named January Littlejohn sued the Leon County School District for withholding information about um, her child's gender identity. In the wake of this lawsuit, controversy adopted, uh, erupted when parents learned that other school districts had adopted policies of withholding similar information from parents. These controversies were specifically cited as justification for HB 1557 in the House of Representatives staff analysis, and they were repeatedly referenced in the legislative debates and the governor's signing statement. In light of this sequence of events, litigation around um, uh, what parents can know about um, children's gender identity. It seems clear that HB 1557 was not motivated by some even-handed concern about exposing children to both cisgender and transgender identities, but a specific concern about exposing children to transgender identities. Indeed, the notion that HB 1557 was motivated 
by even-handed concerns about exposing children to cisgender identities is patently false and absurd. During the legislative debates and when he signed the bill, the governor repeatedly and specifically expressed concerns about schools exposing children to, quote, woke gender ideology, the, ging the gender bread man, transgenderism, and a book about a transgender boy named Max. There were no concerns expressed about exposing children to cisgender identities. And then finally, substantive departures. Um, these are decisions that Florida made in this case that are different um, from uh, previous uh, decisions uh, of a similar nature. Since Florida achieved statehood in 1845, it has rarely targeted the discussion of a class of persons in public schools. Indeed, all of the examples to date seem to be focused on same-sex couples. Again, in 2003, it required instructors to teach the benefits of monogamous heterosexual marriage, but not monogamous same-sex marriage. Similarly, in 2022, it prohibited now instructors from discussing sexual orientation and gender identity before fourth grade. But of course, they still allow discussions of race, sex, religion, disability, and all other characteristics during these grades. It may be now, it's not clear what the meaning of the critical race theory law is, but discussions of race may now similarly be uh, constrained, but I don't think that's going to save the law under this analysis. As the US Supreme Court explained in both Romer and Windsor, discriminations of an unusual character especially suggest careful consideration to determine whether they are obnoxious to the constitutional provision. In other words, the more unusual discrimination is, the more suspect it is in the eyes of the court. Notwithstanding these constitutional difficulties, Florida's HB 1557 has already inspired copycats. In April 2022, the state of Alabama completed an astonishing turnaround. One year after repealing an anti-gay curriculum law, the state followed Florida by adopting a new one. In language that is remarkably similar to Florida's law, Alabama's HB 322 provides that teachers in kindergarten through the fifth grade at a public K through 12 school shall not engage in classroom discussion or provide classroom instruction regarding sexual orientation or gender identity in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. This language was added as a floor amendment to a bill that was originally designed only to prohibit transgender students from using bathrooms consistent with gender identity rather than birth sex. I say only, I find that equally unconstitutional and immoral, but in other words, the, the, the scope of the bill was first about transgender bathroom usage and then um, discussions of being LGBT were added. In a rather striking admission of discriminatory intent, the sponsor of this amendment explained it. He says, quote, we just don't think it's appropriate to be talking about homosexuality and gender identity. You know, they should be talking about math, science, and writing, especially in elementary school. In the coming months and years, we will find out whether the United States Supreme Court will stand by its word and by the principles that it has already articulated over decades in Romer, Lawrence, Windsor, and Obergefell by striking down this new wave of old anti-LGBT laws. Thank you, and I look forward very much to your questions and comments. Thank you. Um, our final speaker on the panel is Chris Mayo. Um, who serves as professor and director of the Interdisciplinary Studies Master's Degree Program at the Department, in the Department of Education. Mayo's publications include a number of books, book chapters, and journal articles in educational theory, studies and philosophy of education, sexuality research and social policy, and educational policy and theory, among others. Mayo's books are entitled Gay Straight Alliances and Associations Among Youth in Schools, LGBTQ Youth and Education, Policy and Practices, and Disputing the Subject of Sex, Sexuality and Public School Controversies. In addition, Mayo co-edited two collections and is currently the editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia on Gender and Sexuality in Education. Mayo currently serves as associate editor of Educational Theory. 
Prior to joining UVM, Mayo served as a professor and director of the LGBTQ Plus Center and in Women's and Gender Studies at West Virginia University. Please welcome Chris Mayo. And uh, Molly was co-editor of one of those books, which I could have said. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, Winston, Piers, Kate. Thanks, all of you all, for coming here. Um, when educators approach new issues and students with whom they are unfamiliar, they usually take up the tools of their trade, curiosity, inquiry, research, thoughtful planning, and ethics to form a solution. The schools that best prepare, train, retrain, and consistently apply both ethics and learning to ensuring that transgender, intersex, non-binary, and other gender diverse youth have full access to their education are the best. Curious and committed educators and communities do the best not only for gender diversity, but also use those same approaches to ensure, for instance, that disabled students have accessible facilities, that students with names that may be difficult for some English speakers to pronounce know that their educators can learn and say their names, and that all school staff are working to ensure the climate of the school is respectful to all diversities. Learning pronouns is not actually all that hard. Learning names is not all that hard. I mean, it's challenging. My name gets mispronounced all the time. It's fine. Um, these are not one and done efforts, but become part of how a school continues to be a curious and caring learning community. Increasingly, we're seeing accounts of schools that immediately fold when the arrogance of fear challenges the work of educating in, with, and for diversity. The heckler's veto has always been a challenge for educational institutions. Sometimes the fearful heckler is afraid their children are learning an approach to math with which the heckler is unfamiliar, or that schools are encouraging girls to be interested in STEM. Sometimes the fear is driven by forms of racism, worried that white supremacy will be challenged, or that children will learn to love one another across races and ethnicities. Some are now fearful that schools encourage LGBTQIA youth to know that they're part of a school community, even if their home community rejects them. Those fears have been stoked, of course. Most people are not actually all that fearful or that ignorant. I like to say this all the time. People are really not that stupid. Um, and so I think something else is going on. And just as an aside, part of my previous work in West Virginia was going around to towns that were debating non-discrimination ordinances that included LGBTQ people. And I got to talk to people who were attending hearings to oppose such policies. Many of those with whom I spoke did not actually oppose the policies. So in other words, they were going to these events to oppose policies that they didn't oppose. In some ways, that gives me a little bit of hope, but I'll talk later about how I'm not that hopeful. Some had transgender friends that they were not able to talk to their co-religionists about, and on one notable occasion, a group of conservative Christian women explained that they did not think trans women were, resp were responsible for child molestation, but that they had been sexually abused in their faith communities and could not find a way to discuss this issue other than showing up with their churches to oppose transgender rights. So as I'm suggesting that fear is motivating a turn to hate and ignorance, part of what we do when we teach and talk to people is realize that they are more complicated than they seem. On the other hand, if they're still doing harm, they're still doing harm, and we should encourage them not to. That we spent evenings making um, materials for adult survivors of child sexual abuse probably goes a little way to try to make some connections but it didn't take care of the fact that they were still getting in the way of non-discrimination policies. We're in a time, as always, where the production of crisis drives the worst sort of determination to stop curiosity, to forestall inquiry, and to interrupt ethics. People do actually know better, and while it's interesting to talk with them to find out how much more they do know, in the meanwhile, feel fearful ignorance is creating a barrier for many educators to do what their trade requires, teaching and learning in ways that support students and educators' development. The divisiveness has now moved over us for the most part, and educators are doing what they've always done, but now it's being couched as if it is divisiveness. But let's assume for a moment that the new push to censor schools is new. What would educators and community members need to know to reconfirm their commitment to teach all students, 
and to learn about all students so they can teach all students. These are in no particular order, but at least indicate, as other speakers have likely pointed out by now, that teaching and learning are guided by professional principles and ethics, and I go to schools and teach them what their professional principles and ethics are, just to remind them. Schools are guided by laws demanding respect for all students. School personnel are not allowed to become bullies themselves or enable peer-to-peer -peer bullying among students. And gender identity is among either the specifically stipulated identity positions that are protected by law and policy, or gender identities are among unspecified categories, which is a, least, uh, a less useful approach but nonetheless are also protected from bullying. And so when you remind, these remind about these professional ethics and policies, it's an important thing to do. But when professional ethics and policies fail, it's a problem. But students, on the other hand, create their own resources and spaces. Um, Molly Blackwell's early work on this um, is, I think, really uh, an interesting way of looking at how kids in queer kids, especially black queer kids, in um, out-of-school centers create space. In work I've been doing with Molly uh, McQuillan, we found that despite a general understanding of their obligations, school leaders sometimes either facilitate or enact bullying by deciding that transgender, non-binary, gender-creative youth do not deserve protection. Elizabeth Payne and Melissa Smith have also found that school leaders will sometimes prevent teachers from getting training on LGBTQ issues because they are fearful that their school boards or community members will object. We know from other issues as well, whether the provision of ethnic studies classes in schools, respect for languages other than English, the persistence of racism and over-identification over of behavior-related issues and suspensions, ignoring and underfunding the needs of disabled students, and more, that schools may respond to fear and ignorance more effectively than they do to the needs of their students. This isn't just on teachers. This is school boards, this is leaders, and this is community members who are enacting the heckler's veto. But to collapse all of this into what schools do is to miss that schools are complex institutions where there are spaces of support created by caring administrators, teachers, and staff, and also created by, by students themselves. S.J. Miller, for instance, writes about the micro-sanctuaries that gender-diverse students create in the midst of uncaring institutions. And Lee Ayrton suggests that having more confidence that trans and queer students can enact their own agency is better than a paternalism that aims at what may be an inaccurate promise of safety from hate. Other researchers are looking at the issue of youth agency from the perspective of black youth, like Tara Vincent Chamber and uh, Lance McCready, both of whom show that black youth create spaces within schools to help sustain them through racist institutional practices and through schools that neglect to understand that black students are also LGBTQ students. Not all of them, obviously. Um, but we also know that transgender youth of color are more likely to face school discipline. They're more likely, as a result, to be involved in juvenile courts. And if they are incarcerated, they're more likely to face heightened danger. And so while the freedom to inquire and create spaces in hostile institutions is a good thing, it would also be a very good thing for teachers and administrators to steel themselves against the heckler's veto of fear-produced divisiveness and stick to what they should be doing, learning more and teaching as they learn. Among the things to learn are that gender identities and diversities have been around for a very long time. Kids are not just inventing transgender identity to, as some who work in schools have put it to me, to get attention or to get on the transgender bandwagon. Young people are doing what we all have been doing, remaking gender in ways that highlight complexities that have already always been there, complexities that are now possible through new technologies of recognition, medicine, and culture. Susan Stryker and C. Riley Snorton each discuss how gender diversity winds together with other changes in social relationships, noting that laws governing gender and clothing were reasserted after the end of slavery in the US out of a cultural anxiety that people who had been previously supposedly clearly categorized racially were now going to challenge that categorization and they were going to challenge other categorizations as well. As in all time periods, excavations at the Battle of Waterloo have just uncovered more female passing as male soldiers. People have lived beyond what the two categories of sex seem to enable, either passing as the other sex or living their gender in ways that did not conform to norms 
or following norms that fear-based responses to gender diversity ignore. As Alex Wilson's research shows too, two-spirit people have always been part of indigenous genders and her respondents understand their gender within traditional, not novel frameworks. Wilson suggests that they are coming into their gender, not coming out as Western forms of transgender and non-binary identity are sometimes framed. So as we teach and learn about gender diversity, that learning requires understanding that binary gender possibilities are not the full picture. And while some who object say that Genesis verse two indicates only the creation of man and woman, the religious tradition from which that verse originates has at least five genders to say nothing of the sex of angels. And I bring up the sex of angels all the time when I train. It never goes well. You think I would learn. People have known about the birth of children beyond the binary and the development of secondary sexual characteristics beyond the binary for a very, very long time. And so as we consider how best to educate about gender diversities, we're also talking about embodied diversities that are already there. Fearful ignorance may either pretend that such diversities are not already present, ignoring the array of chromosomal, hormonal, and cultural differences among people, but they are simply incorrect. And so schools can and should step up with information. We've been talking about providing information and definitions of truth, but we also need to step up with ethics and we have to be more active in our advocacy. Teaching about trans 101, including terms, science policies, and expensive legal settlements that have led to transgender, intersex, and gender diverse students getting the recognition and respect they deserve from schools is not enough. Educators and community members also need to know how to look out for what will go wrong in their attempts to be equitable, inclusive, and just to trans, non-binary, intersex, and gender diverse youth. Even careful, well-intentioned districts can be pressured by anti-transgender organizations or even school board members and school leaders. Like all forms of education, education for inclusiveness requires constant attention, rethinking, and analysis at all levels of school policy and practice. Educators who care about their students, their coworkers, and their communities need to be prepared for a continuing struggle to recognize and respect LGBTQ people and intersex people, and to provide educative forms of support for learning about these issues. The intensification of legislative attacks against transgender youth signals not only the unsettled social context of what has been significant progress, it signals the determination to do harm. The backlash against transgender youth also signals a renewed embrace of ignorance over knowledge, cruelty over caring, abuse over responsibility. And so while I can tell you a lot of really nice stories about talking to a lot of really nice people who came to get, take away the rights of a lot of other really nice people, at the end of the day, it's important that our advocacy point out to them why taking away people's rights would be the wrong thing to do. Schools can and must make a difference, providing students and their families with support during times when they are under attack. Not only is such support crucial to developing strong communities, it's also crucial to enhancing the learning of all students. And when I talk to teachers and administrators about this, and pre-service teachers as well, I reinforce what many of you have said today. These are not tasks that you can do alone. Even if one teacher or leader or counselor or staff person can make an important difference to students otherwise struggling in hostile schools, things go much better when that person is not alone. When educators can learn to work collaboratively to either reinforce an existing positive school climate or build a new one or share a positive school climate with another school. Learn about resources in local communities. They can also help with suggestions on how to ensure that gender identity and sexual orientation are included in non-discrimination policies and anti-bullying policies and updated trainings and strategies for putting everything into practice. Help to build professional development programs that are kept up to date on the needs of diverse students, understanding that LGBTQ students may also experience racism, sexism, classism, ableism, and other forms of exclusion. And know that the LGBTQ communities need to challenge those biases as well. Be able to educate the queer and trans students. Don't just educate other people about them. Educate them about their responsibilities to other people as well. Educators know the value of education, so reinforcing that we all need to keep learning about the changes in policies and practices that ensure more equitable communities can become part of regular professional growth. 
Understand, too, that there will be members of local communities who will object to inclusive education. Make sure you know the educational reasons for what you're doing. Reinforce to your communities, too, that LGBTQ families and students need to be confident of their access to schools. Be ready to communicate up-to-date information on terminology, gender affirmation processes, the potential negative school outcomes associated with biases, and so on. If students are, willing, students are willing and able, encourage them to also be involved in maintaining respectful school communities and help them to develop their leadership potential as they build their own communities. If students indicate they are facing difficulties in school, listen to them and work with them to ensure that there are resources to support them. We are running into this constant ebb and flow of uh, recognition and respect of rights. New court cases, laws, and policies will complicate or offer new ro routes for justice-oriented practices in schools. But educators should consistently recognize and respect LGBTQIA diversities. And this means as well recognizing those internal diversities in our communities. This work requires constant maintenance. And all that also means going above and beyond what policies and practices require and sometimes also working determinatively against regressive and harmful policies, holding to professional ethics over local fear. It means, too, being willing to learn from students, their families, and communities about what yet needs to be done in and with schools. Issues will shift, terms will change, new opposition to equity will arise. If we've learned nothing from the last several years, positive change is fragile always under challenge, and also amazingly durable. We owe a great deal to the many students, family members, and, and school professionals who've shown a willingness to improve schools, even under the most daunting conditions. Keep fear at bay with the best possible forms of education. Thanks. Zane, do you mind joining us up here, please? So is, will some Zoom magic happen now? You're on the Zoom magic? Excellent, Excellent. thank you. So thank you all um, for your talks. I, when I am listening to you talk, there's part of me that, um, particularly I'm thinking of uh, Chris saying the determination to do harm and listing other things. There's a part of me that kind of yearns for divisiveness, right? Like I'm just like, ah, I need protection. Um, and space sometimes provides that, but to, um, tie us back to the theme of um, our panel, I want to raise the question of it. Um, and so I wonder, well, I, maybe I'll start here. Um, I'm wondering if you have examples from each of your own um, fields or experiences or research of uh, the most effective ways youth have responded to the kind of divisive impacts that you shared with us today. And I don't know whether Cliff heard it or not. Well, on, on Tuesday, the kids in my town in West Virginia walked out of their high school when the local school board, which had otherwise been very, very liberal, banned pride flags. So on the one hand, bless their hearts for walking out. And on the other hand, it's so regressive, I don't even know what to say. The principal has since said, if teachers have pride flags on their coffee cups, he won't police that. So profiles and courage. Um. Thank you, and I'm sorry. Is he with us now? Oh, it's okay. Oh no, Cliff. Oh no, that's you're good. You're all good. Cliff, can you hear me? Okay. All right. No, you're good. I appreciate your help. Okay, so um, I'll raise a few more questions and then see if um, any of you would like to raise any. Um, in what ways in your respective fields do you see through and out of our divisive society? Or is that even appropriate? Hopeful up note. <laughs> <laughs> I might need to shift my questions. <laughs> Out and through our divisive society. Um, you know, I mentioned at the end of um, my presentation the concluding notes about um, how to respond to these, um, these divisive policies that seek to drive a wedge. And I do think that the solution 
is really structural. It's about um, changing the way that institutions um, create hierarchies of belonging. And I think it can start at really simple levels. I used the example of um, trying to think about if there's a rational reason to segregate sex by sports. And if you really dig in and if you want to engage with people on these terms, you can ask things or you can say, okay, yes, testosterone does uh, contribute to faster the development of fast twitch muscles. Um, but by the same token, there are ways that biological differences give advantages to people assigned female at birth. And so it's really interesting to think about long distance swimming, I guess, women tend to dominate um, because if you have um, more fat, you float. Um, and so you're floating and all you have to do is, is swim, right? Whereas if you have more muscle, you're heavier and you sink. Um, there's also lots of sports where there is no reason to have sex segregation. So, for example, archery. Um, I think some people would argue skiing because of technological innovations, etc. And so I think looking at things um, from a structural perspective and also drawing on evidence to the extent that we can. Again, I hate to engage in, with the, it on those terms because I think we're living in a moment where, you know, my evidence is your non-evidence and facts aren't going to get us out of this mess, but to my mind that's one of the ways to approach this. I could uh, speak to that. Um, can folks hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, it's such a deep and difficult question, right? What is the, the only way out is through, as I say, and what is the way through uh, divisiveness? And it seems, I mean, you know, in an ideal world, um, I would love to see kind of education on structural inequality of all kinds um, become the norm and everyone be educated and at least a majority, uh, not only of Americans, but of the necessary majorities given gerrymandering and, and even just the fact of a Senate where every state gets two votes. Um, win the day, but I think as a pragmatic political matter, the only way out of divisiveness necessarily means some appeal to values that we all share. Um, and I know that's not a popular uh, position, but um, the people who are pushing the divisive policies also have to, they feel like they don't belong and they have to be made to feel as though they belong as well. And that's not, that's not, right now, that's like not even possible in this polarized landscape. But if we're not appealing at some level to values that we all share, I don't know a way out of, another way out of divisiveness, um, that belonging for everyone. Uh, understanding that, you know, uh, there's a privilege critique there uh, and all kinds of um, uh, problems with uh, the articulation of so-called common values. But I don't know how you win enough votes um, without that. And it's becoming harder and harder, of course. Both sides are committed to critiquing um, the other side's appeals to common values. So it's becoming uh, more and more difficult. Uh, obviously, a certain level of divisiveness is just life, but we do seem to be at a high level now that is making it very difficult. Um, uh, it's been decades since uh, students walked out on a Salt Lake City high school that abolished gay-straight alliances, but every time a teacher shows a pride flag in Utah right now, it's a crisis, and, you know, they can lose their jobs. Um, there, there, are, there are schools that don't want uh, a policy like this that are saying no flags except the Utah flag and the U.S. flag. So no pride flags and no MAGA flags either. Just to give you a sense of the, the divisiveness um, and how it plays out in a state like Utah. Thank you. And those comments resonate with um, something that Dr. Ben uh, Prath talked about earlier in our conference today about finding common ground and figuring out what we share and working from there. So I appreciate how your comments 
are resonating with that. Um, I will also say I'm, um, I've, uh, bit, I, I had the great fortune of getting to teach an LGBT lit class at a uh, high school, a local high school, and I looked at the way kids talked across differences, and then there were times when kids, instead of talking across, di well, well, they, w they would move toward each other or away from each other, and when, um, when, to use Chris's words, that people were determined to do harm, people would move away from each other in ways that were healthy and smart, and of course they, they moved away. But then there were also these moments where they would move closer together um, when they trusted each other and when they were um, compelled by each other. Um, but the, the, where the most problematic parts is when they ossified, when they stopped moving one way or the other. And so um, even in our moving away, I, I find some hope in there just as, as movement. Um, but I wanted to, um, I, I had one more question and then I was uh, gonna invite you to have questions if you do. Um, and that was what you make of divisiveness as a strategy on what it looks like in the context in which you work and live. Seems to be working really well. Very effective, very yeah, effective, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, oh yeah, go ahead. You look like you're thinking, Zane, I'll give you a minute. I am thinking, and I'm also like, we had a big lunch, and so I'm a little slow right now. Um, <laughs> Me too. I, I, um, I, I like this point that uh, Clifford made about people who push divisive policies feel that they do not belong. And I think that that is uh, an important observation that potentially invites us to step away from asserting a claim on rights and thinking more about groups of people and identities or political positions that are similarly arrayed in relation to power. Um, and when we think about it that way, what that does is that creates potentials or on-ramps for coalitions across unlikely groups. So I have this reading of Taylor Swift's uh, music video um, oh my gosh, I can't remember it now. The one, it, it's set in um, what is meant to be like a, a glamorous queer trailer park. And they're invaded by people who are coded as um, working class, rural uh, Trump supporters. And at the end of the video, the argument is, and there's a little screen that says like, please support this, uh, this legislation. I think it's the Equality Act that would benefit LGBT people. And the argument that I make in the reading of that video is that by pitting those two groups against each other, first of all, it re relies upon erasures, right? Um, that we're on stolen native land, that not everybody's citizens and has access to rights, that not everybody even can access rights equally. Um, and forecloses coalitions across those groups that are living in economically depressed circumstances, regardless of who they are as their identities, right? And so I think um, thinking about ways to, again, create on-ramps to coalitional work and thinking about it as a shared relation to power is one of the ways to move outside of divisiveness. It's interesting that you mentioned the erasure because I noticed that as a theme across all of your papers as we're talking about um, the, w the erasures of people and what the consequences are for both those being erased and those doing the erasing. The damage it seems like does on both ends. I would just say um, uh, where I sit uh, as a political strategy, divisiveness is at stunning success. Uh, to speak to the issue of transgender girls participating in sports. We have now, for, in, for about 10 years, Equality Utah has been working with the LDS Church and the legislature and the governor to actually pass pro-LGBT laws. And then this, um, this new reality emerged where we had brokered some kind of a, a, a truce uh, some kind of a third way on uh, transgender girls participating in sports. Frankly, it, it made us sick. Uh, it was a, a committee solution that w was, uh, it, it was borrowed from Maine. In Maine, they have a case-by-case -case analysis rather than just letting all 
transgender girls play. It was bet, you know, it, was, it wasn't a ban. That was the point. The legislature didn't want a ban. The governor didn't want a ban. The church didn't want a ban. Um, and it was amazing to see the politics play out at the end because they delayed voting on the bill until people filed for Republican primaries because they knew that if they voted for any bill short of a ban, a total ban, that they were going to get primary from the right. And then even after that deadline passed, the, the right wing rose up in such force that they flipped enough people that the legislature passed a ban. Uh, the governor vetoed it and they overrode the veto. Uh, the, the, the leadership of both parties lost control of their parties to the kind of far right. Um, after 10 years of working together and compromise. Uh, and they actually said, please sue us to strike down the ban so we can get back to work on getting transgender girls on the field. And fortunately we did, and so far we've won. But it's, I've, it's uh, down is up and up is down when, when the people who on the other side want to work with you and then say, sorry, we lost control, please sue us. I mean, a, it used to be, Let's work together. Don't sue us. Um, and uh, they can't control their own party anymore. Uh, it's so the playing to the base is so strong now. Um, uh, it was a, a, a really stunning. And now they're going to they're trying to repeal our ban on conversion therapy. Uh, once they got one victory, they want to see how far they can go. Um, so I, it does seem sadly effective so far to play to the base. Yeah, and I, I'd want to follow up with that too because um, going to schools low these last four years before the pandemic, the first series of trainings I did, they were very interested. By the second series of trainings, they wanted to know if following what I said was gonna get them fired. And they got clarification from school superintendents who said yes. And so I think the, the weaponization of LGBTQ youth against teachers unions, because this is, remember, also West Virginia that had a fairly successful teacher strike until the legislature reneged on the deal. Um, they're also seeking to punish teachers caring for kids by taking away the means by which they can care for the kids. I was working in one school that had been accommodating a young trans boy and the teachers got together and said, what do we do? We've now been told we have to misrecognize this kid who has only started to flourish in our classrooms because his gender's been affirmed. How do we turn that around and still support the kid? So they're asking the right questions. And you know, 40, I think it was 40,000 teachers left West Virginia to go teach in Pennsylvania and Maryland. So the answer may also be run out of the hills, but then the kids are alone. So the divisiveness has worked. I'm gonna invite other questions. It looks like you have one. If you don't mind coming up to the mic, that would be great. Apologies for taking the mic again, as if I didn't have enough mic time today. Um, I wanna, I have a question, but I hope you will permit me one uh, half a minute of lighting a candle first. It's a difficult comment I wanna make. Uh, my niece, who was a transfer student to OSU and a transgender girl, passed away in her dorm room in, on March 17, 2021. Um, if she hadn't passed, she would have been here uh, enjoying this panel tremendously, definitely enjoying it more than my talk. Um, and uh, so I just, you know, wanted to speak her name, Rose Ben Porath. Um, and I wanted to ask a question that I think she might have asked, which is that um, a lot of you have spoken on legislative um, efforts against transgender young people, as well as on efforts to push back against these legislations. 
And I wonder if you could speak as well to um, some of the uh, responsibilities that people can take on the ground for creating great, greater inclusion and belonging for trans folks. So I know, uh, you know, some of you yourselves are doing this work as a more um, established activists or professors, et cetera. Are there things that we can do on the ground level with the students, their clubs and organizations, in seminar rooms, and in other spaces on campus uh, to accept and include trans young people? Thank you. You ask really good questions, and honestly, I feel like in conversations, you've also answered them, right? You look at your buildings, and you see, can your students possibly use facilities in the buildings? I went with um, some trans friends of mine down to do lobbying in the state of West Virginia, and we tried to figure out which restrooms would enable them not to get out of the legislature having been beaten up. So that was step one, right? So it's assessing the architecture looking at the policies that are already guiding you and being willing to talk to colleagues about the policies that you have and whether they're sufficient and whether colleagues even know how to enact policies. I've talked with TAs just recently who know nothing about our Title IX protections, even in the state of Vermont. They're very nice and thoughtful and wonderful people. They really are very smart. They just don't know who to call. And so even having dry runs about what to do if there's a problem Call the office and find out who you talk to. I did this once back in the 1980s and found out that none of the offices that I was being sent to, this was more about um, uh, lesbian and gay stuff than trans stuff back then, but none of the offices knew that they were even, they even have had this as their purview. If you find an office that doesn't have a pur doesn't know what its purview is, work with them to make it work. Figure out ways with people who already have a lot of experiences, and I know other people on the panel can speak to this, with navigating what makes their life go better. Do you want to be asked about your pronouns, or do you want to wait until there's an appropriate moment in a conversation where you feel like sharing? Some people's pronouns are complicated, some people's pronouns are easy. And we get used to following rules without thinking, but the kinds of ways of, of creating comfort and community are things like jokes. They don't happen by authoritarian decree. They happen by comfort and familiarity and knowing people who experience things differently. So keep asking and keep opening the possibility that they'll know things differently. And make those connections with universal design, with intersectionality, with indigeneity, to know that all of the models we're looking at, I mean, the, a lot of the models I talk about are very Western Anglo models. They're, they're not models that necessarily respond to people in Thailand or people I know in the Philippines who would see this as part of tradition much the same way that Alex Wilson talks about. Um, I think those are all good ways. You know, but you know, Sigla, you also remind me that we you've talked about this in your talk this morning, that we don't know enough evidence. We don't know enough to say to people this is how one form of intersex works. And be aware that 3% of people that we are encountering are intersex. 3 to 10% of people we're encountering identify as trans or non-binary. The numbers are going up. And they're going up because we are creating conditions whereby people can come out even though they're coming out in times of divisiveness. They're coming out because they're doing good work. And so I don't know how you congratulate people on having done good work, but I think that's something we all also owe one another. Oh, this is Cliff. Um, I guess the first one would say I'm very sorry for your loss, and I appreciate you sharing that story with us. And you ask such a another good, deep, and challenging question, and I think um part of the answer is this question of how, like how do we reach out across these divides right um and i think part of that is to hold our own beliefs opinions ideologies loosely um 
to, to try to find connections. Now, this is something that, you know, we shouldn't have to do. It shouldn't be our burden to do. And yet it's, it's, it's here to be done when possible, as much as possible, as much as someone can tolerate, um, is to, um, to reach out and to listen deeply and receive someone's emotions. Um, and, you know, not capitulate, but still validate their humanity. Um, so that we can continue to come together across these divides and, and at least keep talking. I, when, I, when I first taught LGBTQ rights, it's called law, sexuality, uh, or uh, uh, gender, sexuality, and law 15 years ago. For the first five years, I had no problem recruiting, uh, and I mean that quite specifically, a conservative student, typically a white conservative Mormon man married with kids into that class and it really enriched the conversation. And I can't, I can't get that person to come into the classroom anymore. I vouch for, I vouch for his safety. And they, they say to me now, <laughs> you can't protect me in that space. I, I, I it's, it's not a safe space for me anymore. Pe people are going to cancel me. Um, and that's a huge loss in that class, you know. A huge loss. That class is now a very much, it's about a fourth the size that it used to be. Um, and it's almost exclusively LGBTQ people. Um, and it's still a wonderful experience, but it would be much richer if, if it were more ideologically diverse. Uh, so I, I think putting down both sides, of course, um, uh, a kind of commitment to purity um, in our ideological commitments and uh, and putting dialogue um, first and foremost. Um, but that's hard, and it's not something we can always do. I mean, I've been discriminated against, and there's times I've turned it into a teachable moment, and at times I just haven't had that in me. <clears throat> or what I had in me was just anger, and I unfortunately expressed it. So it's, it's a very hard thing to do. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just chime in real quick. Uh, first of all, I want to echo what everyone has said. I'm sorry for your loss. And I think that um, one of the things that we can do on the ground is uh, to recognize, and I love this theme of divisiveness, is that everyone has a sexuality and everyone has a gender. And that this is not a situation in which certain people have gender and certain people have sexuality. We all do it. I think this goes to Cliff's point about the books, right? Um, and so even just making discursive shifts, and Chris talked about this in terms of, it's not hard to learn pronouns, right? We can do that and we should be asking everybody their pronouns. Um, and and allowing those things to be visible so that everyone's genders and sexualities can be visible and we can unite around those things. It's on there. Thank you. I think I think we're right about time. Did you, okay, all right, excellent. So thank you so much for um, your question and I am also sorry um, about your niece who I wish were here. Um, and thank you panelists for your insights and thank you all for being part of the conversation. I'm really grateful to learn with you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, everyone. And now I will just say, uh, to echo what's just been said about uh, thanks, once again, thank you everyone uh, for sticking around for the uh, last session of the day. This has been such a rich and rewarding day spent in conversation with one another about, in, about matters of enduring significance. Um, I'm looking forward to the next chapter, if you will, the next iteration of an ongoing conversation. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>